Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, distinguished guests, participants, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the seventh World Investment Forum and to this panel exploring the link between international taxation and investment with a particular emphasis on the implications of the recent changes promoted by the G20. My name is Richard Bolwin. I'm the director of the investment research branch in Angta. I would like very much to take this opportunity to, um, to thank our partners for the organization of this session, the Vienna University Tax Policy Center, chaired by Professor Jeffrey Owens, who is also my co-moderator in this session and a long-standing collaborator and friend of UNCTAD's Division on Investment and Enterprise. Uh, actually, with, uh, with Jeffrey, we have long promoted cooperation and exchanges at the intersection between the international investment tax and trade policy communities, and that's also one of the objectives of this session. Um, <clears throat> now, the investment tax link in particular has been very high on our agenda in UNCTAD for quite some time now. Um, the World Investment Report 2015 highlighted the close connection between international investment and the tax optimization strategies of multinationals. Um, I recall at the time that our analysis was quite well received. I recall some long conversations on it also with David, who was one of our keynote speakers today. Uh, we tried to provide a balanced perspective showing both the contribution of multinationals and international investors to tax revenues in developing countries, and also the tax losses caused by tax avoidance practices. And we've tried always to maintain this sort of balanced perspective on our work in this area. Um, since then, our work in this area, well, has had several highlights and achievements. Um, just to mention a few on the analytical side, we published some of the first estimates of uh, the tax revenue losses due to FDI constructions and among the first quantifications of the taxes paid by foreign affiliates uh, worldwide. Uh, on the policy side, just a recent example, we recently published, together with Jeffrey's outfit, a guide for tax policymakers on IAAs, on international investment agreements. Uh, basically, a what tax policymakers need to know about IAAs. Um, and we also on that worked with Michael Leonard, our other keynote speaker at UN DESA, um, because this was a product that was requested by the UN Tax Committee. So quite a few areas of work there for us. Um, but of course, at the same time, uh, the BEPS project uh, with our colleagues at OECD has uh, made even more impressive steps forward, uh, leading to this quite historic juncture where we are now, only two weeks ago, 136 countries agreed to introduce a minimum tax rate for multinationals. So uh, a very uh, monumental uh, point in time. Now, whatever the specific opinions or oppositions people might have on, the, on, on that, it's certainly undeniable that the minimum tax is a big change, uh, not only for tax regulation, but also for the international investment landscape, um, particularly for international tax competition and the use of tax incentives to attract FDI. Right? That makes it very important to us in the investment division in Anta. Um, now, therefore, the investment and tax communities have to engage in a debate on the implications of the changes uh, for tax-based investment promotion schemes or bigger picture, I would say, industrial policies. Uh, for developing countries in particular, we need to understand the implications for the industrial policy toolkit that includes investment policies, incentives, special economic zones, et cetera, all potentially affected by changes in the international tax regime. Uh, we should also accelerate the discussion on the interaction between tax and investment treaties, uh, between IIAs and the double taxation treaty networks, and on the cross-fertilization between the reform processes going on in both of these communities. So let me wrap up. The objective, therefore, of our talk today is uh, mainly to stimulate the debate between the tax and investment communities and also for us in UNCTAD to further guide our work, our future work on uh, the, the connection between tax and investment policy. Now to do all that, we have a stellar group of experts and speakers and panelists and an experienced and might I say highly engaging moderator, Jeffrey Owens, and I would like to pass uh, the floor to you, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, before I, I, I let you start, just a quick um, point of attention for our audience. 
and our uh, platform uh, providers have experienced some technical difficulties this morning here and there with the connection. Um, should you lose the connection on the platform, there is in the chat box an emergency Zoom link to also follow this session. Um, with that, Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Richard, for that introduction and welcome everybody. My name is Jeffrey Owens and I head up the Global Tax Policy Center at Vienna University. Um, I can only emphasize what Richard had just said. To me, the main purpose of this, uh, this afternoon is to start and to continue the dialogue between the tax community and the investment community, because what's coming out on the tax side is going to have an impact on the way the countries compete for investment. Yes. So I hope we can achieve that. And I think when we come to the end of the session, we can spend a few moments of asking, in fact, what are the next steps? This is not a one off event. Hopefully it will lead to a new program both at the UNCTAD and in the UN Tax Committee as well, yeah? Um, as Richard said, we have a nice mix of, of speakers. In fact, um, all academics are on, online, uh, the business community, governments, international organizations. Um, so it's a very good audience to have the type of discussion that we're looking to, uh, to achieve, yes? The, the structure is Richard and I will co-chair. I mean, I will chair this session, Richard will chair the second session. Um, under each session, we'll have one speaker who provides an overview uh, of the issue, and then we move into a series of rounds of discussions, yes? Uh, and if you have um, questions, you can put them into the chat show, and if we have time, we'll come back and try to answer those questions as well, yes? Uh, one thing that I think is important, um, and I, this is a plea to the speakers, both in this session and the next session, try not to use too much technical language because we want, in fact, people to understand what you're talking about, yeah? So that's that's an important thing as well, yeah? And I know that's not easy for tax people because we tend to be very good technicians. And we assume that other people know what we're talking about and generally they don't, sometimes they don't even care what we're talking about as well, but that's another issue as well, yeah? So with that, why don't we move on then to the, um, the first session then? Um, and this is very much about the, uh, what is what are going to be the implications of the minimum tax proposals um, that are coming out now of the uh, the OECD, the G20, the Inclusive Framework Forum. Minimum tax, now you've seen it's 15%. It's not at least, it's not more, it's 15%. Correct, David? 15%. So we're at 50. We know the number we're working with now. That's already a big progress. So what impact is that going to have on competition, in fact, for, for investment and for services? Yes? Will countries have to review the way they use their tax incentives? Will, it, will the agreement actually prevent the race to the bottom? Something that I know Torf wants to come in on. What impact, and this is picking up a point that Richard made, what impact will it have on the industrial policies of less developing countries, the way they try to catch up with some of the OECD countries? Yes? Will we see new forms of competition emerging? And with the elimination of tax, certain tax incentives, are these going to be subject to a challenge under the sustainability clauses in, in, in international investment agreements? So there's a whole set of issues, in fact, that, that we'll be discussing in this session. The one thing we're not going to discuss, my friends, is the merits of the whole pro, of the BEPS 2.0, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. That's for another debate, and I'll be very happy, in fact, to moderate that debate as well. But let's this time around, it's minimum taxes, and that probably is, is going to take up most of the afternoon in uh, the session as well, yeah? Uh, so that's the focus then, Pillar 2 of the package. Um, I'm very pleased to have David. I think it's fair to say, David, I mean, you've been the man that's been undertaking all of the, the economic analysis, all the, 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 the facts, not false facts, but true facts that underlie what OECD has been putting on the table. So I can't think of anybody better placed than David, in fact, to, to start us off this debate. And I must say, you know, there have been criticisms of the outcome, but nobody is contesting this is transformational. This is not tinkering with the system. This is changing the fundamental rules of the system. And that's why I think it's been so difficult, David, from the political perspective, because you know it's hard when you're making these structural changes, particularly at a time when the world economy is in a rather fragile state. Yeah. Um, so with that, after David has made his presentation, uh, we'll then move on and we'll, the panel that we have, we have Zara from Anglo-American, wave your hand, Zara, so everybody knows you, yep. Uh, uh, we have Mick for XIMF 
And Mick, I'm sure you, he's going to advertise his latest book, which is one of the most amusing books ever written on taxation, yeah? A historical book. Lorraine from Texas University, who is actually no stranger to UNCTAD, so I'm sure she's going to be contributing. Tove from Eurodad, who will give us the perspective of civil society um, and the NGO community. And then Logan, who heads up the, the African Tax Administration Forum and will give us the African perspective on this debate. So that's the context. Those are the people that we're going to have. So with that, David, the floor is yours. 15 minutes after that, I chop you off, yep. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. And it's great to, to join uh, such a, a distinguished panel. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Hopefully you can now see my slides. Uh, I'll give uh, a short presentation, 15 minutes. Uh, I'll begin by talking a little about the background that has led to this agreement. Um, and then to talk a little about the, the details of what was agreed and then offer some observations on the economic impact assessment work that we've done in terms of what we expect will be some of the, the implications of the reforms. And I should say that uh, thanks for the, the nice words, Jeffrey, but um, a lot of people doing uh, that work here at the OECD, I'm just fortunate to lead a, an excellent group of, uh, of people. 60 people now, I gather, David. Yes, 60 people. Uh, it's, it's, it's growing, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent team of, of people. So the, the, the background here is that the economy has been changing uh, through digitalization, globalization, and this is something that we've all been very much aware of. We've been witnessing this for many years, uh, and that has had transformational impacts across the economy, but it's also put the international tax rules under great stress. And we, we saw um, a response to that in the BEPS project, or for those that are not familiar with the, the acronym, the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, that was initiated and led by the OECD and the G20 between 2013 and 2015. And there were a series of, of reforms that were agreed at the international level, and uh, a number of them being what was then described as minimum standards uh, have been implemented by those countries that signed up. And originally it was OECD and G20, but after having uh, delivered the BEPS project, the G20 asked the OECD to create a new body, which is called the Inclusive Framework on BEPS, which now has 140 jurisdictions who come together on an equal footing. And uh, they have all committed to implementing those outcomes from the BEPS project, and indeed have been a part of these discussions uh, that led to the agreement uh, just over a week ago. Now, the BEPS project made significant progress, but uh, it is true to say that on some of the, the more fundamental questions, such as the, the questions around digitalization and the digitalization of the economy, were left unresolved. And they were left unresolved because there was no political consensus to take action at that point. And that sometimes happens. And this project has, has taken some twists and turns over the years as we've, uh, we've seen the political tide uh, come in and, and go out. And through that period, in reaction to the lack of progress on these questions, we saw a number of countries decide to effectively take matters into their own hands. And, and that uh, took a number of forms and perhaps the most visible uh, expression of that was in the form of unilateral actions such as digital services taxes. And these digital services taxes, which many of you, uh, even those not necessarily experts in tax would have seen in the, the financial papers, uh, even uh, more broadly in the media. Um, you know, countries like France introducing a digital services tax and then that prompting trade retaliation or threatened trade retaliation from the United States. And then uh, in response, the EU coming uh, in behind France and threatening to, uh, to, to come back with a, another round of retaliation. And we saw not just that example, numerous examples of countries taking these matters into their own hands with unilateral measures. And that really has started to lead to a fragmentation and a, an undermining of the stability of the international tax rules. And in fact, through our impact assessment work, we modelled what the, the counterfactual of no agreement might be. And we took into account the trade retaliation. And under a worst case scenario, we modelled that that could have an impact of more than 1% on global GDP. So really potentially quite significant. So the counterfactual is not um, nothing happening. It's likely that it would have been more of this uh, disagreement and disputation. Now, so what happened? Uh, as Richard uh, said out a little earlier, uh, just over a week ago, 
uh, not before 140, but 136 member jurisdictions of the inclusive framework agreed uh, to a, a reform plan. And uh, they represent collectively more than 94% of global GDP. And there are two pillars to the, the reform. And that is pillar one, uh, that we'll talk about a lot less today, but I think it is important to, to, to mention this because the two are inextricably connected. There would not have been a political consensus amongst those 136 countries had there not been these two pillars. Uh, but pillar one effectively seeks to reallocate taxing rights. It, it's about redressing an in, inadequacy in the international tax rules that's built around this. 100 years ago, when the rules were essentially put in place, a country had a taxing right where there was a physical presence of activity being generated in their jurisdiction. So a firm had a physical presence in their jurisdiction. Now, obviously, in the modern economy, you can have a huge commercial presence without necessarily having a physical presence. And that is one of the key sources of tension that has led to this discussion. Now, Pillar 1 effectively will bring about the reallocation of taxing rights on more than 125 billion US dollars of profits. And that means that profits that are taxed or not taxed in one jurisdiction today, there is a taxing right that is, will, will soon be available to other jurisdictions. And essentially that's about uh, shifting to market jurisdictions. Pillar two, where we'll put the, the main focus today is uh, an effective minimum tax, a global minimum tax with a rate of 15%. And we estimate that that will uh, generate uh, somewhere in the order of 150 billion US dollars in additional tax revenues each year. Now, Pillar 1, uh, I'm not going to talk about this in, in detail. I'm just going to mention four important things um, in terms of how this departs from the existing tax rules. Firstly, Pillar 1, um, really, for, for the first time, we look at the multinational as a group, as a global group. And we look at its profitability, we look at its size in terms of its revenue, and profitability above 10% for just over 100 of the largest multinational groups. We then have a look at that profit, that above 10% profit, and 25% of that gets reallocated to market jurisdictions. That's where the consumer, or in the case of digitalized firms, where the user is located. So there's not currently a taxing right often in that location but there will be a location. So the first thing is we treat companies as a corporate group, a global consolidated group. The second thing is that we no longer need physical presence. So we give a taxing right in circumstances where a certain amount of, of sales are being generated. In addition to that, we allocate taxing rights based at least in part on a percentage formulaic, uh, uh, formulaic percentage. And then um, finally, we allocate that right to the market jurisdiction. Now, all of those things are things that really would not have seriously been considered just a short time ago in international tax terms, but they have been part of the agreement that's been reached in order to ensure that this question of digitalization and globalization can be adequately uh, taken into account in the modern uh, tax system. Now, moving on to pillar two, I'll move through the elements quickly here, but there are a number of rules and it's worth just understanding. There's an income inclusion rule, which gives the, the, the location of headquarters the ability to top up tax where less than 15% is being paid um, in other jurisdictions, top that up to the 15%. There's an under tax payments rule, which allows jurisdictions where there's activity happening and payments, uh, related pay, party payments going out to be able to uh, uh, top that up. And then there's a subject to tax rule, which operates separately through bilateral treaties, which uh, uh, will allow where certain payments of interest, royalties and other defined payments, allowing uh, a top up amount, not 15% for the subject to tax rule, but I'll come to that. Now, um, companies that are in scope are those that have a revenue above 750 million euros. Uh, there are some exclusions, uh, limited ones, I set them out there. As I said before, the 15% rate applies to the two principal rules, which is the income inclusion rule and the under tax payments rule. That's the globe rules. But the subject to tax rule is a, is a separate treaty based rule that will actually have priority over those rules. And then there's the question of the effective tax rate. You have to calculate that. It's a top up tax. So if the home jurisdiction has a tax rate of 
and 12% tax is being paid in another jurisdiction, you can't claim all the way back to the 30%. You can only claim up tax back up to that minimum amount of the 15%. Uh, but this effective tax rate, and it's important, it's not a statutory test, it's, a, it's a, an effective tax rate test. It's based on a common definition where covered taxes contribute to the, the numerator and the tax base is determined as the, the denominator by reference to accounting income. Now, the subject to tax rule I mentioned earlier, it has a 19% rate. This is a nominal rate uh, and countries um, in particular where um, they are low income or developing countries um, have the ability to uh, insist upon these uh, being included uh, in their tax treaties. And this is something that, uh, that Logan and, and many of his colleagues uh, representing developing countries advocated very strongly for and were very successful in, in securing. So just to be clear, David, so the 9% there is, it's not an effective rate, it's a nominal rate, yeah? It's a nominal rate, yeah. yes, yeah. it's a nominal rate. So yeah. um, it's, it's, it's and, and, you know, trying to um, have an equivalence between a nominal rate and an effective rate is, is yeah. not an easy exercise, yeah. but you know, I think 9% is, is, is a reasonable estimation or approximation, uh, but it was, it was arrived at through the, 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 the political process in the inclusive framework. Now, there will be carve-outs uh, on tangible assets and payroll. So this is to recognise um, where real substantive activities are taking place. So that will, um, that will be taken into account. 5% uh, of the carrying value of tangible assets and payroll. There will be a transitional period for 10 years. We, we need to take into account the guilty, which is the, the US uh, minimum tax, and there are various proposals to strengthen that, um, but that's an issue that's been considered. Importantly, the status of the GLOBE rules, uh, they do not require all jurisdictions to implement them, but we will need a critical mass of jurisdictions. Uh, why do we not need everyone? Well, to some extent, it's because of the interlocking nature of these rules. Um, they effectively give taxing rights to a a, a series of different countries at different stages. So if less than the 15% is being paid, um, there's a reasonable expectation that some jurisdiction somewhere along the line is then going to top that up yeah. and take uh, the, the remainder between that uh, low tax profit and the 15%. Uh, and it's the expectation that someone will take it that effectively makes these rules work. Now, in terms of the investment effects, and these are some of the um, ex, the ex ante study that we did uh, to estimate some of the impacts, um, we, we estimate that both of the pillars will have a relatively small uh, impact on multinational enterprise investment costs of, of, of groups. Um, we estimated 0.1%. That was in the impact assessment that was released back in October last year. Um, we, um, we think that that will affect, um, pillar one will affect the, the most profitable M&Es, the largest and most profitable. And pillar two, of course, will have the greatest impact on large M&Es above the 750 million euro threshold that are um, currently benefiting from low effective tax rates. Now, both pillars um, we expect will support global investment and growth through indirect channels uh, that are, are significant, although less quantifiable. And we set them out in our report. Um, we, we believe in particular pillar two, but both pillars will have the effect of reducing the incentives for firms to engage in profit shifting. If you reduce those tax rate differentials, the difference between the rate in one jurisdiction and the minimum, which is what they will have to pay somewhere, uh, then that reduces some of the, uh, the incentives for firms to engage in profit shifting. Now, I mentioned earlier the 0.1% of GDP impact um, on investment costs. Uh, we, we do think that that needs to be compared against the counterfactual of not reaching agreement and not stabilising the tax system. And we estimated, as I said earlier, that the impact under a worst case scenario of this trade retaliation arising from digital services taxes could be more than 1% of GDP. Uh, in terms of tax competition, Pillar 2 is not designed to eliminate tax competition, but it seeks to put in place a multilaterally agreed floor on such competition. And that's at 15%, as we said, an effective rate. Uh, we think that one of the impacts will be, one of the implications will be increased relevance of other factors, um, non-corporate tax factors, but also non-tax factors more broadly. Uh, and uh, things such as the, the overall framework uh, conditions, such as the, the skills of the population, the infrastructure, 
the existence of well-regulated markets, rule of law, all of these considerations. Um, and of course, the substance-based carve-out will have uh, a, an impact to ensure that uh, where um, these where tax incentives are driven towards generating real economic activity, that there will be some recognition of that in the way in which uh, the calculation of the effective tax rate uh, will be undertaken. Uh, and uh, as, as I alluded to earlier, we think that um, competition will continue amongst states. Uh, now, some of that will be in the non-tax space and some of that will potentially be in the non-CIT tax incentive space. Um, we do think, however, uh, many of those other potential incentives are likely to be more transparent and, uh, and to some extent, in some countries, more difficult to, uh, uh, to just be, uh, to, to be dishing out without uh, any accountability. Uh, now, I'll leave it there, Geoffrey, but um, I've tried to cover a fair bit of uh, territory and hopefully that's uh, within the, the time bracket that you were expecting. You're, you're actually 20, 34 seconds under your time. So that's great, David. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the rounds of discussion, are there any pressing questions that any of the panelists would like to have to David? Not comments, but pressing questions. Quite happy to take one or, one or two. Who would like to put a question to David on that? Don't be shy. Oh. Okay, well, let me put a pressing question then to see what that just, just one, um, the, um, in a sense, I think that the way that it's structured, if I were a developing country and I had a relatively low tax rate, uh, I would feel under quite a lot of pressure, in fact, to get into the system because they, I mean, otherwise I'm going to basically giving up my revenue to a, a, a residence country. Is that correct? Yeah, look, I, I think that um, the, the, the thing about, so, so pillar one, I'll just quickly deal with that. Pillar one, um, Developing countries will generally benefit from that yep. because yep. of the, uh, uh, the nature of where the, the money is coming from. Uh, pillar two, uh, the, the, the thing to note is that we're talking about additional revenue. There's no reallocation mm -hmm. of revenue as yep. under pillar two as there is in pillar one. Uh, so in that sense, there, there is more revenue to be generated for governments generally. And, and that's a matter of some interest. It's not the only consideration, obviously, for governments. Um, I, I think. Um, the what is of interest um, to many uh, many developing countries is also the, the notion that often in the in the past they have felt that they have been under a lot of pressure to offer tax incentives mm -hmm. in order to attract investment. Now, um, of course, they will continue to be looking for all of the tools in the policy kit to attract investment. But when you have a multinational that you're dealing with, and they say we would like to undertake some investment in your jurisdiction. Um, the, the goalposts move a little bit between a discussion around whether or not you're in the space of talking about a tax holiday or whether you might be talking about a reduced tax rate that might be, for example, at the, mm -hmm. in, in the order of 15%. So I think that there has been a lot of interest um, from many developing countries from that perspective because policymakers do feel as though they are under a lot of pressure in those uh, ongoing discussions and negotiations around the attraction of, of, of development and investment in their jurisdiction. But I, I know um, Logan is, 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 is going to uh, be participating in the panel and, and he will sure, be able to speak more to directly that, yeah. to these questions. Um, I, I've just got a question, an interesting one from the audience. And I'm just gonna put this to you. What happens to the other inclusive framework non-member countries and to what extent will the effectiveness of Pillar 2 be affected by those that opt out? <laughs> Really sorry, Jeffrey, but I just had my phone ringing here and oh, I didn't hear sorry. the first part. I'll, I'll read it before. again. So there's a question from the audience. What happens to the other inclusive framework non-member countries and to what extent will the effectiveness of Pillar 2 be affected by those that opt out? Yeah, so look, um, good question on, on both fronts. So the first thing is that we continue to engage closely with the, the four members of the inclusive framework that did not sign up and, and join the agreement. And we are hopeful that we will be able to, uh, to be able to, to bring them into the agreement over time or for, mm -hmm. for them to join the agreement. Obviously, it's a matter of their volition and, and, and we continue to talk to them about the, the benefits of that. Uh, but the sovereign states, it's entirely up to them as to, to whether they do join. Uh, if they don't join, um, what will the impact be? And, and I guess that goes to the point I was making a little earlier that even those that have joined, not all of them will necessarily implement mm -hmm 
the rules of pillar two. Yep. And, um, you know, that's, for example, if you happen to be a, a zero tax jurisdiction, you may not want to implement rules mm -hmm. um, to this effect, but if all of the countries um, around you um, or the countries uh, that, that, that entities are, uh, are engaging with um, or have uh, subsidiaries in uh, and are dealing with you, if they all implement these rules, then effectively uh, that will be uh, have the same effect in ensuring that the multinational will have to pay uh, that minimum level of tax. So, um, and, you know, whether there's the country of headquarters that has the income inclusion rule or whether it's the, the source jurisdictions that might be applying the subject to tax rule or the under tax payments rule, um, there will be subsequent bites of the cherry, if you like, um, mm -hmm. in addition to the existing taxing rights that the system currently provides. So we, we think that um, you don't need everyone to be on board, but we certainly want as many countries to implement. And part of the, the common approach is that if countries are to do something in this space, they agree to do it in line with what uh, has been agreed. And those um, countries that are a part of the agreement agree to respect the implementation of these rules by others. Yeah, and I think that's what makes the agreement rather politically attractive for, for all countries. In fact, there's a certain amount of flexibility that's there. Yeah? Why don't we move on then to the, the, the uh, rounds of discussion? We'll have three rounds. Um, and I'll just ask one of the panelists to kick each round off and then the other panelists can come in. Yeah. So the first round, let me just start with Zara. Um, uh, how, how do you think developing countries are, are going to react to this in terms of investment? Um, do you think, in fact, that um, you know, multinationals are, are going to be a little bit regretting that some of the tax incentives they've got used to are going to be taken away? What's, what's, what's the view from the, you know, your side as, as the sort of the vice president of tax of a large multinational? Sierra. Um, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, and, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, as, uh, as we are waiting, desperately waiting to know more about how Pillar 2 particularly uh, will work in practice, um, those are the kind of questions that we, that we are asking ourselves. Um, certainly, uh, Pillar Two will will probably will certainly will will probably um, foster a, a new type of incentives uh, from from countries, indirect tax, um, employment tax holidays, probably um, different ways to actually uh, make sure that their uh, investment. Um, Profile uh, become it's still 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 stays um, attractive for companies uh, like R and D or or other type of, of more um, you know on on the transaction type of investments. Um, I would say tax incentives, applying tax incentives um, to, to certain activities like like R and D uh, would would probably be uh, something. Um, uh, that, that will stay, that will remain on top of, of mm -hmm. um, developing countries' uh, perspectives at, in terms of yeah, um, raising their profile. Mm -hmm. But if you think about um, each industry and their, and their own profile, if you think about my industry, the mining industry, we, do, we are binded uh, and bounded to, to a certain territory. We can't move a copper mm -hmm. mine to, to somewhere else. We just have to stick in there. So um, understanding the mechanism uh, that will allow us to maximize investment uh, mm -hmm. while, while actually uh, helping the country to, to remain competitive mm -hmm. there is very, very important. And sometimes accounting and uh, and the way we we actually look at the, at the overall tax rate in the beginning of the investment uh, can be um, can be different to to you know other 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 in industries and other types of investments. But, but I suppose it would be a it's fair not an comment. Easy question. It, it's, it, but it, no, that's why I asked you first. Yes, I know you're <laughs> very good at answering not easy questions. But I suppose, in a sense, what you will be looking at is. How do you, because I've always felt that incentives are, are not a big driver of location decisions. Where they are a big driver is how you structure the investment, how you finance it. Yeah. Do you have a yeah. subsidiary? Do you have a PE? Yeah? And those factors will still be there in terms of how you decide, in fact, to, to operate in a particular country once you've decided to go into that country. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I think so. Uh, even though, as I said, uh, I, I was very glad to see that uh, some carve outs for intangible assets for tangible mm -hmm. assets were, were put in the in the mechanism, because uh, if, if you think about a capital investment, a capital intensive um, business like mine, right, like 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 the mining industry, uh, you have typically a very, very large investment in the beginning bringing you a lot of losses mm -hmm. just because you have to dig the hole in the ground and you have to 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 cost to to build the mine then um what traditionally happened uh, up to now is that you you get um uh, accelerated uh, depreciation for those investments and and that brings the, the tax rate of your investment just below the 15 percent mm -hmm. because you will not pay taxes for a long time then so if you don't adjust for that. Uh, the risk you create with for the country actually is that uh, a mining company will have to top up their 15% taxes. In my case, to the UK, mm -hmm. uh, taking off money from from the country where the mine is located. Mm -hmm. So those those very um, it's not incentives. It's really basics uh, basic economics of how an investment needs to be structured and and needs to work uh, and. Uh, you know, there are certain incentives that work like that, but those are good investments, good incentives, because mm -hmm. those those kind of incentives actually develop the country, develop the workforce, if you think about R&D, develop, create a, um, a partnership between the company mm -hmm. and the country. There is something very virtuous that we shouldn't be um, yeah, letting go. Basically. Which is why I think the carve outs are a really new feature yeah. of this proposal that is key for developing countries. You know, Mick, I mean, you did a lot of work at the fund on some of the spillover effects. I mean, what's what you view on how the, the globe is going to affect investment decisions, perhaps particularly in developing countries? Um, well, thanks, Jack. Well, let, let me first of all say, really echoing you and, and Richard about uh, really what a massive and historic achievement this uh, this deal is. I mean, not necessarily, I think, in terms of its immediate kind of aggregate effects, but um, you know, we're, in, we're as David described, we're bringing in principles that really just a few years ago were unthinkable in terms of the international tax environment. So, <clears throat> but let me leave aside the the question of sustainability and so on. But I think it's a it's a massive achievement on the. Um, on the incentives issue, I guess uh, one would start with the kind of the happy narrative. I think the happy narrative, uh, from my point of view, with the same skepticism about the effectiveness of incentives that you mentioned, Jeffrey, is that, you know, you start with a, a broad, genuine broad based minimum tax makes incentives that uh, offer less than uh, that are under the 15 percent makes them uh, unattractive. And it's natural, I think, as you were suggesting, Jeffrey, for the countries offering these incentives to soak up the additional tax themselves rather than let it go to somebody else. Uh, so we have an increase in revenue, we have a reduction in um, incentives that I think our view has been that they've been generally ineffective. And, you know, as David was saying, then we expect countries to spend more on good stuff like training and all these kind of, uh, you know, nice infrastructure. So that's a kind of very nice, happy narrative. And I, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, let me just mention some other things maybe we should think about. Some One is that some people worry, I don't actually very much, some people worry that the 15% becomes not a, a, you know, not a floor, but a ceiling. Um, that people, the countries will, will tend to reduce the rate to 15%. I actually don't buy that argument. Um, I don't think there's much evidence that that's how the tax competition game has gone on in the past. Um, countries have generally reacted to tax increases elsewhere by increasing their own taxes, not by cutting them. Um, but it's an empirical question, and uh, I, I could be wrong on that. But I, I don't buy that argument. But it's nevertheless, I think, one that we should we should uh, we should yeah. raise. The exception, perhaps, is in this substance-based carve-out. I mean, there, I think, there clearly will be an incentive. It may be more difficult for countries not to go along with that, and maybe there are good aspects to that. But um, again, I'd be somewhat um, somewhat skeptical. So that's, I think, one um, uh, more of a concern for me. A couple of other things. One is, I think. Um, as David mentioned, um, um, you know, one of the things that we'd expect to see more of is the uh, use of spending measures to attract uh, to attract investment, and that does have, as, as David says, a an, an, uh, potential advantage of uh, transparency. We've often argued that there should be tax expenditure analysis for uh, incentives, making the spending component clear. Spending measures would presumably make that much clearer. And I'm just a little bit more skeptical about how much transparency on its own on its own does. Um, but again, I think that's something to think about. Um, 
another more complicated issue that maybe we'll get a chance to talk about later is I think as you've as you've emphasized, we're talking about a kind of an average effective rate. And that's different from the statutory nominal rate, depends also on patterns of allowances. Um, so I think one come, one issue that, um, as I say, maybe we'll come back to, um, that I think countries are going to have to think about is, well, how do I get this balance between the nominal rate and the uh, pattern of allowances of various kinds that I provide? How do I get that right mm. so as to meet the 15% uh, the uh, effective target and be as attractive for investment as, uh, as I'd like mm. to be? And that may actually point towards some good tax reforms. But in any case, I think that's one, one of the issues to think about. I, so I guess, Jeffrey, that's my kind of broad take. I sort of, a, a, yeah, a, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've got to come back to that. I think the last issue yeah. is an interesting one. If it gets countries to think more carefully about how they design the incentives and how that interlinks with the rates they choose, that's a plus thing. And then, David, you know, you don't have to comment on this yet, but, uh, you know, maybe the, one of the things that the inclusive framework should have discussed is that should we have had a band, a minimum rate and a maximum rate? Yeah, you can think about that if you want to come back to it later on, because that'd be an interesting. Take us back to Rudin, yeah, 25 years ago. Um, uh, Logan, um, you know, a, a lot of your, your member countries were a little bit concerned about the way the globe was impinging on their fiscal sovereignty, yeah? their ability to design um, their tax systems to reflect their own economic, social, political environment, and in particular, in the developing country context, the African context, to, to in essence, compensate for the lack of the, some of the fundamentals that you need to attract investment, like a good labor force, like access, like political stability, et cetera. What's, um, do you think they're gonna buy into this? I mean, um, does the, the fact of having these uh, carve outs for substantial activities, does that alleviate some of these concerns, Logan? Thank you, Jeffrey. I think it is clear that uh, on, on the African continent, uh, extended incentive regimes are largely, uh, is a big part of the investment strategy uh, uh, happening here. And so these uh, minimum global tax rate will have a very direct influence. Uh, uh, effectively, as David says, putting a floor um, uh, either on the reduction of corporate tax rate globally or the type of incentives that is provided. You are asking uh, two questions. Uh, 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 the one about the sovereignty goes beyond uh, the incentive issue. Uh, I mean, the two African countries that didn't join uh, yet um, is actually stuck on the sovereignty issue uh, and the DS, the, the digital services tax and the abolishment thereof and the cost benefit analysis between that and the agreement. But that's for, for another day. I think the carve outs are important. Um, I think Zahira has explained um, that you can't really move uh, 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 those type of investments. And it's kind of different in the way you handle that uh, with the rest of the more mobile type of multinational investments. Um, I think that putting that floor has going to make, uh, you know, the policy decisions or the decisions on granting incentives uh, at a different level. I think countries are going to have to adjust the design of the tax incentive regime, includes, including uh, increasing the uh, applicable corporate tax rates to ensure that profit is generated. Now, we would have preferred a, a, a minimum tax rate of 20%. The, the average, I mean, the corporate tax rate in Africa ranges from between 25 and 30%. So the, the BEPS factor uh, is reduced, but probably not as effectively reduced as in our case. Um, but it was a negotiation. We take what we get out of it. Um, but I think that developing countries in general and here in Africa, we probably going, we are going to be required to make several uh, changes to these uh, these tax regimes, and this will include a review of domestic laws relating to those relating to those incentives. Uh, talking about the uh, uh, the uh, stability clauses, part of that is going to be renegotiation of some of those resource expo exploitation contracts, uh, renegotiation of investment treaties. And it's very, we had some meetings over the past 10 days here on the continent, and that was quite a topic of discussion. And yet it is kind of, despite the work that has happened, it is kind of interesting, off scary to see the lack of knowledge uh, of the understanding of the agreement. And we realize that there's a lot of work to be done 
amongst tax people, there's a level of understanding amongst policymakers, very thin. And so uh, we're gonna have to do a lot of work to explain the broader agreement, but probably also because the incentives is, is such a big part of it, um, the implications of uh, the global minimum tax and what that means. And so the global, uh, the fiscal stability provisions in domestic law or in investment contract with foreign in investors will pose some challenges in, in, in implementing uh, the pillar two rules. And so there's a, there's a lot that needs to be done. I think it's important to say that on the, there's a lot of pluses here. Uh, uh, at the risk of repeating one or two, it's gonna force a certain level of transparency. Mm -hmm. It's gonna force the continent to look at some of its treaties, but there are a lot wrong with treaties on the continent that needs to be fixed. It's an opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey, when you were at the OECD, one of the things we, we very clearly learned from the business interest in the task force on tax and development was that incentive was never number one in the investment decision. It was somewhere number 13. And it will force this continent and its leaders who keep on believing that incentives is number one, I don't believe it's always for economic reasons that those beliefs has emerged. There were a lot of personal gain here, yeah. uh, corruption for that effect. But it will force the continent's uh, e economies, the jurisdictions to actually confront the fact that if Africa wants investment, it's gonna have to build its infrastructure and supply electricity and supply roads mm -hmm. and, and give sustainable and good human resource uh, 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 you know, products for, for an investment environment. So incentive has never sustained it. It's only benefited them, uh, the businesses. And I think this uh, global minimum standard, despite the rate, is gonna help this continent tremendously to force a different type of policy decision. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's always convenient to blame an international organization. Oh, we have to do this because they have said that we have to do it. And you've always wanted to do it. It's just an excuse. Yeah? Um, just two comments on that. Um, one, this issue of stability clauses, which probably Michael Lennon will pick up in the next session. Yeah, uh, I think that's important because, I mean, the issue here for the, the, the audience is, you know, when a country is, has a bilateral investment treaty that has a stability clause, and the danger is, is that would that limit the ability of, of a country, particularly developing countries, to eliminate certain tax incentives that have been promised, for example, a 10-year holiday. Yeah? It's an open question. Yeah, and, and a lot depends on whether the multinational feels it has something to gain under that or not, yeah? So maybe that's something that we, we want to come back on. Tove, you've been very quiet. I mean, you should be a happy young lady, yeah? Um, I mean, this is what you've wanted, a minimum tax, you know? So tell us why you're happy or unhappy, as the case may be. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, first of all, uh, I don't think you'll find any sign of me asking for a minimum a tax of 15 <laughs> percent uh not the 15 percent i agree yeah but you know you have to start somewhere 15 20 who knows where it's going to be in 10 years time yeah yeah uh, i think this is a very interesting uh, discussion and uh, we are seeing the debate about the 15 percent uh, come up now um in my own country uh, originally i'm danish and we definitely have a corporate tax rate that's way beyond 15 percent and it didn't take long before some actors started saying, we need to lower the tax rate because the new normal is 15%. The debate about effective or not in, in mainstream politics, we're seeing that the pressure to go to the minimum is there. And uh, one fear is that this will impact developing countries uh, as well. As Logan mentioned, uh, many developing countries uh, have tax rates that are way beyond uh, 15%. So we are fearing a, a race to the minimum, if you want, uh, on, on this. Race to the minimum, new for expression, yes. Yeah, so. Which, uh, I mean, until we hit 15%, it's going to look just like the race to the bottom has looked. And then, yes, the 15% is a floor, but a floor with carve-outs. I mean, we should also not be blind to the fact that it's a 15% with some footnotes and, and carve-outs mm -hmm. in it. Um, but, but the other thing, I think, in the discussion about what will developing countries do now that this new deal is here, it's important to be aware that this is not a global deal. Uh, we had over a third of the world's countries were not participating in mm -hmm. this negotiation. And uh, among the developing countries that were participating, we had both Kenya and Nigeria 
and say that they would not sign on to the deal. So the reality for, for most developing countries is that this is not their deal. Mm -hmm. uh, they've not agreed to it. And there are very clear reasons for this. Uh, there are several parts of the deal where, uh, for example, headquarter countries are given better conditions mm -hmm. uh, than uh, developing countries. So they raised a number of very specific concerns, very, very well founded. And one of them is that on this pillar too, uh, the fact that the rules are designed so that the headquarter country uh, gets to uh, tax first, uh, many countries say that that doesn't matter and the important thing is to have a minimum, but you'll see that all the countries that argue that are the headquarter country. Yeah, uh, and it, it comes to the point, I mean, there's still details that have to be worked out here, and those details are almost as important as the, the, the principles that are being given. But I, I think what I would take from you, Tov, is that perhaps this is um, an opportune time and for the UN committee to be actually looking at this a bit in a bit more serious and in a little bit broader context rather than focus on specific issues. Is, is that would be correct? Oh, yes. Uh, there's a lot of work for the UN committee to do, also to look at the developing country perspective on this. Um, because we can see what came out from the OECD led negotiations that developing countries were an afterthought. Uh, I think it's, it's important to be clear on the fact that developing countries' interests were not uh, as central to these negotiations as the large uh, OECD countries. I, I think that's going to be a very important uh, point. But there's also so much that hasn't been discussed in these negotiations. Um, for example, we have recognition of the concept of a minimum effective corporate tax rate, but uh, there are many much more efficient ways of doing it. For example, uh, this minimum rate only applies to corporations that uh, have an annual turnover of 750 million euros uh, per year which means that the vast majority of the world's multinational mm -hmm. corporations are not covered by this yeah. agreement. And uh, I think the Irish response was interesting because they said we're introducing 50% uh, corporate tax rate for that group that of group, the yeah. largest, but for the rest, everything will remain the same. Yeah, it's, it's a segmentation, if I dare use that word, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lorraine, you've been very quiet, yeah. You've done a lot of work in this area. What are you going to contribute to this debate on what's going to be the effect of this um, this globe, this minimum tax in fact on investment flows and on the distribution of investment between different countries? Lorraine, over to you, yes? Thanks. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, delighted to be here. My sort of view is the counterfactual matters, right? And the design, the, de the devils are in the detail of the design, as we've been hearing from the speakers. I mean, my first best solution would have gone back to worldwide taxation on an accrual basis with a full foreign tax credit up to the level of the home country's tax, but those days are long gone. Uh, and in a world of territorial taxation where we stop taxing uh, subsidiaries and branches of m and at the water's edge, and so there's no tax on foreign source income, no wonder there's been a drop in corporate income taxes and uh, lots of investment hubs and tax havens. Um, there's a new paper out by Mike Devereaux and a couple mm -hmm. of others that just came out the other day looking at the tax elasticity of investment. And it's actually high, it's 2.5 or something. So the impacts have been significant. And I think it has caused all kinds of um, <laughs> manipulations uh, that are we as economists, I think we think the world would be better without so am I in favor of, um, of pillar two of a global minimum tax? Yes, uh, done right uh, with everybody. Is it, is it in. done, is, and is it done right, Lorraine? Well, my worry is maybe that, the, I mean, we heard Tove say the same thing. The problem is that not everybody's in. Um, not everybody's in, you don't have to sign on. Uh, there is a, a carve out at the bottom, which could be an opportunity to manipulate things. And remember, it's a 15% on a base. You still can manipulate the base, which means you can reduce the effective rate of tax by playing with you know, the deductions that can be done in a particular country. The other thing is, I think, um, for me, it really matters, and I haven't heard this, and this came up in Tove's remark too, the first right to crack here, I think, should still be the source country. In other words, you put on a 15% minimum tax, that source country should be able to raise its rate to 15% and get a full foreign tax credit 
off against this pillar one tax. Why do I like that? Because this is a new form of first crack principle. It's a first crack up to the minimum. And that means investment hubs and tax havens that might otherwise have been at zero have a real incentive to grab that 15%, that 150 billion that David talked about and put that on infrastructure. And you know, Michael talked about this too, the way that 150 billion could be spent by developing countries uh, in a pandemic, <laughs> uh, in the context of industry 4.0 and all the digital changes that are going on now. Uh, it, for me, this offered a real hope to developing countries for economic development, uh, another way out for the havens in some sense. Mm -hmm. But the but, devil's but in is the it, details. Is it pushing them towards the old industrial base? Because I mean, the, well, the, giving a deduction for labor and property, plant, yeah. and equipment is. I would have yeah. given them a deduction for digital investments. I see. That's what I wanted to hear. Yep, David, this is the time to bring you in. Yes, you've been very quiet. Any comments on anything that's been said in the last ten minutes? Yes? Look, I, I think um, just on that last point about um, providing uh, carve outs based on some form of, of digital investment. Um, and presumably we're talking there about intangible investments. Yeah, that is actually has been one of the central drivers of profit shifting behavior uh, over recent years. So to some extent, um, you know, there are elements of these reforms when taken together, both pillar one and pillar two, uh, that do make some significant structural changes that, that take into account that one of the big challenges here has been around the mobility of uh, of, of, of capital, but in particular, the mobility of, of intangible assets and intangible investments. Um, look, you know, there are lots of good points that have been raised in terms of, you know, those that I would put in the basket of the devil is in the detail. And uh, 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 of course, um, you know, people should scrutinize those discussions as they continue around uh, all levels of detail of, of the agreement. I guess I would just, um, for one moment, suggest that there's some value in just taking a step back for one minute and recognising that um, the system um, in a number of fundamental respects has been broken and has been broken for a number of years. Um, and we have gone through a process, no process is perfect, but unlike the process that generated these rules 100 years ago, where there were a very small number of countries involved, there have been a much larger group of countries involved. Uh, I can say personally, as someone who has been involved in these discussions, I've seen how uh, developing countries have been able to secure a number of key concessions through the discussions. Um, they certainly wouldn't have been able to secure them if they weren't at the table. Obviously, they should be at the table. But the inclusive framework has given people the opportunity to be at the table. And, um, you know, there will, there will always be arguments about, well, we would have liked to have got this, we would have liked to have got that. Um, but I think one of the, the measures of, uh, of the success of a process that's multilateral like this is that we reached agreement, countries were able to reach agreement with some exceptions, but by and large, um, that captures 94% of global GDP. Um, and um, most of the countries that, were, that came to the table walked away pleased that there was agreement, but not happy with all of what was agreed. <laughs> and that's what happens when you have a compromise. And I think to get a consensus amongst 136 countries, um, you know, we have to be also recognised that that's a practical challenge and there will be compromises. And all of the purity around the type of system we might, you know, um, you know, think would be the best case scenario needs to be tempered against what is practically possible. Uh, but I, I still say that if you had said to me 10 years ago that what was agreed in just 10 days ago, that that would have been possible, um, even I would have been sceptical. So, you know, I think it is worth just, you know, refreshing, you know, there's always debate where more could be done but but this is a really significant step forward i think that's absolutely correct yeah just one question um you know a lot of developing countries including china develop uh, spend a, 
depend a lot for their development on special economic zones. And, you know, and yesterday there was a fascinating session in, in the World Investment Forum on, on SEZs. Is, is that going to impact special economic? Is the agreement going to impact special economic zones? Because I mean, these are basically tax-free zones, huh? Yeah, well, look, uh, to the extent that the way Pillar 2 operates, it operates on a jurisdiction basis. Yep. Uh, so, you know, whether those um, low, um, whether that under tax profit is, is being generated in, you know, a small location within a jurisdiction or more broadly across a range of, of entities in that jurisdiction, uh, the minimum tax will apply. Now, there, there are to be, um, and, and the, the most detailed um, statement of, of where the discussions um, have been progressed to um, can be seen in, in, in elements of the Pillar 2 blueprint that was released back in October last year, where there's a lot more detail there. Mm -hmm. But having said all of that, the agreement that was reached 10 days ago, um, there will be more detail released. Um, some model rules, draft model rules will be released uh, by the end of November. Um, we, we are going to see a lot more detail um, in the not too distant future. And, you know, I certainly encourage everyone that has a view on this to express that very robustly in the context of the devil in the detail discussions that will no doubt continue. But, but I also think that it's really important to, 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 to just maintain a sense of the context of what has been achieved in a world where multilateral agreement on it doesn't seem to be all that easy to achieve on many things. Yeah. Tax is a particularly difficult area to do it, and there is an agreement. And I like the fact that we may be the model for multilateralism to show that it can actually work, yes. And one last issue that we've not touched on, um, and it comes back to a point that Lorraine raised, um, how is this going to affect the use of IP boxes? Because we, you know, I mean, I call them weapons of mass destruction and they're all over the place now. Is that going to change? Well, the, um, certainly uh, the Action 5 work in BEPS had already been having some effect. It's not, you know, it was not designed to, um, to, to stamp out IP boxes, but it was to, designed to ensure that uh, to the extent that a tax benefit was being provided, it was being provided uh, in relation to um, where expenditure generating uh, that income had been incurred. And, and uh, compliance with that is something that has been mm -hmm. largely achieved, even though we've seen more of the, the IP boxes. Let's watch this space then, yes? Yeah, uh, but, but, but as a matter of principle, there's no, there's no um, carve out, if you like, for um, IP mm -hmm. box related activity here. So um, Pillar 2 applies and it will, uh, or it will apply. Um, and you'll look at the, at the effective tax rate as determined, as calculated. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a jurisdiction basis, and uh, there's a, a range of, of tax treatments that, that um, you know, would be um, ordinarily accounted for in the accounting. Mm -hmm. um, they may not be such an issue, but when you're talking about things like patent boxes, certainly if they're driving down effective tax rates, uh, they, they are potentially affected. Thanks for that. Are there any pressing questions or, or last comments that the panel would like to make? Yeah? Anybody wants to make a last comment? Can I, can I make one? Sure, Jeffrey? Nick, go ahead. Yeah. Just, um, just, just on this devil in the detail point. I mean, clearly that's true, but um, you know, to be, to, to exaggerate, I think this is a case where the devil actually isn't in the detail. I think the the, the, the what's important here for me is the principles that have been accepted, mm -hmm. as, as David briefly described. The idea that we can have formulaic assessment methods, we give taxing rights to market countries, we have minimum tax. It seems to me that's where the, I don't know if it's the devil or the angel, but those, I mean, that, that seems to me the thing to uh, to keep a focus on. And, you know, the bigger question is, you know, now the genie's out of the bottle, where is this going to end up? I'm not sure we should necessarily think that this is the end of the story, yeah. much as, you know, it might be politically nice to say so. Yeah. So, um, and I think that's, so just, that's a count, just, a, just a counter view. No, to that, the that's devil, a lovely way to devil. finish the, this session in a sense that, I mean, you have two comments to terminate the session. One, I mean, almost all of our debate is a fair look at how the, the, globe, the globe, the minimum tax going to affect developing countries. My friends, get real. This is going to have a pretty big impact on OECD countries, yes? Yeah? Even some that have 30, 35% nominal rates, yeah? they're going to have trouble getting above the 15%. Yeah? And the second sort of concluding comment is, you know, this is not the end of a debate. This is the beginning of a debate. The floodgates are open, yeah? Maybe in 10 years' time, we'll have a global formally apportionment, yeah? 
If you can accept it in one area, why not in other areas? That's because what we've done with this agreement, we've superimposed a pretty complex system on an existing complex system. But the existing complex system hasn't changed very much. Yeah? So I see this as really the start of a debate. The good news is that for academics, business, international organizations, and tax lawyers, we are not going to be bored over the next 10 years. Yes? There's going to be plenty. David, you keep putting out stuff that we can actually be commented on. So look, with that, uh, I like the, th uh, we, we, you may think we've gone over time, but Bruno, give me an extra 10 minutes. So we, we have a little bit of time more left. So I'd just like to thank the, well, first to thank David and his colleagues. Yes? Congratulations. I think nobody's contesting. This is a landmark uh, agreement. Yeah. Like to thank the panelists. In fact, you've been very patient with me because I've talked too much. You haven't talked enough. And that's, that's a bad thing for the chair to have to say. Yeah. Logan, don't smile because you know what I'm like. Yeah. You know, I don't get a chance to talk anymore. These just I've been I haven't been on a plane for two years. Yeah? So, so this is a rare opportunity. I, I talked to the dog, yeah, but he's not interested in tax. Yeah? So with that, then um, let me just um, again thank everybody for for this this round. As I said, I see this very much as the start of a debate, and it's going to be an interesting debate. Um, now um, uh, I would turn the floor over to Richard. If I could ask the, the panelists on this session to put your screen off, yeah, put your video's camera off, and could I ask the panelists in the next session, and Lieslot is already there, Lieslot's always ahead of the crowd anyway, yeah? So if um, you could put on your screen, and with that, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. You're a uh... You've done a, a great job in sticking to our uh, our tight uh, time frame, so we'll move on to uh, to the to the second round, and um, that's going to be about the connections between uh, international investment agreements and tax treaties. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit different discussion. Um, we have a, a wonderful introduction now by uh, Michael Leonard from um, uh, head of. Uh, uh, International Tax Corporation at UNDESA, New York, who has taken time off his busy schedule now because we're in the middle of the uh, UN Tax Committee. So very much appreciated. Um, and then we have three panelists following that to elaborate on this topic. I will introduce them later, not to take up too much time of Michael, who will then probably have to attend to his duties at the Tax Committee again. Uh, Michael, if you're ready, I uh, pass the floor to you. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for the invitation to UNCTAD. Yes, we have the UN Tax Committee at the moment, and one of the uh, agendas is uh, one of the agenda items is tax trade and uh, investment agreements. So we've even added in the the uh, 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 the uh, trade agreements as well. Uh, I'll coming be coming at this issue from the perspective of someone who's negotiated investment treaties long ago but also tax treaties and who's a public international lawyer by training. And I think it, that emphasised that this is an area where we need uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, analysis of a lot of these issues, something that, that UNCTAD has, has done on this issue. I'll talk about that shortly. I'll speak in a personal capacity as we await what the UN Tax Committee says on this issue, but there has been work in the past uh, and uh, I uh, suggest that if it's interested, if you're interested in that area, look at the the past few meetings of the UN Tax Committee, and there's some relevant documents. But particularly uh, at the, if you type in UN Tax Committee 23rd session, you'll see a paper on the issue, which which brings you up to date with what's happened and what we're proposing to be done within the committee, working with uh, colleagues such as UNCTAD, in fact. So there are serious overlaps and interactions between uh, investment agreements and there's been and tax agreements and tax measures, and this insufficient attention uh, has been paid to them at government level. Well, why is that? And I think one of the reasons is that there's a lack of awareness amongst tax officials of the potential, potential impact of non-tax agreements on tax agreements and the, the tax measures and also their tax administration because there's often uh, 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 jurisprudence about legitimate expectations not being met and so forth. So the way in which the administration carries out its work is also very important. There's a lack of awareness amongst uh, investment negotiators of the potential overlap with tax treaties, including the, the coverage of tax treaties and, uh, and, and what the jurisprudence in, in many of these areas has been, and also 
what the best practice is on some of these areas. And that's something where, again, UNCTAD has done some very good work, which I'll refer to. Uh, very importantly, there are challenges in achieving the whole of government approach. And I think the previous two points relate to this, to preempting problems, to identifying them, and then to responding to them. The tax worlds and the investment worlds are often poles apart, even though there's a, a obvious a linkage between tax, part of the purposes which of which is to give a, a, a good investment climate to encourage uh, investors in for the sustainable development of the country. Uh, there's another reason why there's a lot of uncertainties about the scope of the overlap, and that's because of the many undefined or very broadly defined terms used in such treaties, the variations from treaty to treaty, and the diverse uh, jurisprudence as to their interpretation in different panels, to the extent that you know that, because a lot of the panel decisions are secret. Yeah. There's also rules of supremacy, which are chosen to address the overlap when it has been identified, but they may not operate as clearly as you would think on first sight. What you thought was a tax matter excluded from the investment treaties operation might be seen differently by an investment panel. For example, one tax stabilisation contractual clause was interpreted by the panel as a tax indemnification clause, such as could exist between private parties. And therefore, it was removed from, from, uh, from the, the override for tax matters. It, it meant that the panel could actually consider the issue. Panels are very often effectively deciding their own jurisdiction. Mm. And certainly from someone who used to interpret, uh, used to negotiate investment treaties, we took a narrow customary international law of the fair and equitable treatment provision, but there's some very, very broad uh, interpretations of that. So often countries feel, developing countries particularly, that what was intended by the treaty has not been met by the interpretations of the panels. There might be questions in the dispute about who decides whether there is an overlap, uh, and, and the decision making on that is, is very uh, important to what the decision is. And uh, again, this is a way in which panels can often uh, have an ability to determine their own jurisdiction. There's also often stark differences between the way disputes are, are settled in the tax world and the investment world. And I think each can learn a bit from the other. The mandatory binding arbitration is the uh, at the instance of the investor is the norm in investment agreements, although that's been a little bit more controversial recently. And in tax treaties, we have the mutual agreement procedure. That's a country to country procedure between competent authorities who are high tax officials. And uh, there is some mandatory binding arbitration, and, and but, but less so most developing countries are strongly opposed to that. That of course is an issue at the moment, whether there should be mandatory third party dispute of, uh, of uh, pillar one issues, for example, uh, amount A and transfer pricing issues. So there may be a change on that. Now there's a recognition that the mutual agreement procedure, which really leaves it up to the two competent authorities to reach an agreement is, is imperfect. The UN Tax Committee is doing what we can to, to, uh, to try and make it work a little bit better. We've completed a handbook on avoidance and resolution of tax disputes, and there will be ongoing uh, uh, discussions. And one of those discussions is with, with developing countries being very opposed to arbitration in tax matters. And, it has to be said, it's largely because of their experience in, in investment uh, yep. arbitrations. Is there a way of getting them more used to uh, uh, confident in a system that involves third parties looking at their, their, um, uh, you know, their, 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 their central tax policy issues? And, and one approach is, is maybe there should be more mediation, non-binding, just to get developing countries confident that yes, this can be productive and this can, can help both them and also the investors in the country. We need a certain degree of confidence. So we have to create more confidence in developing countries. Whether the proposals which are being put forward in the, in the context of, uh, of, of Pillar 1 of the OECD Inclusive Framework work uh, will achieve that is uh, is yet to be seen and, and that's one thing i want to say we we don't yet as lawyers we don't yet have a legal regime for for pillar one or pillar two we have a statement of of of, of uh, at a political level at an executive level 
We don't know uh, who will, uh, what the convention will look like exactly. We don't know who will join it. Um, we don't uh, uh, know, uh, for example, there are a lot of UN countries that are not members, even members of the inclusive framework. And some of them, including some big markets like Nigeria and Kenya, have stood apart from, from that statement. So we don't preempt what the legal regime is. And the legal regime will be uh, central for investors and central for tax officials. So this moment of, of when we're moving from the political statement to the uh, legal uh, expression of that, the convention and the legislation is a moment where I think it's very important that there be a look at, at how this, this new regime will interact with your investment regimes. Um, I mentioned the UNCTAD has done this, uh, it's black and white, I'm afraid, but I'll hold up the page of this, this very impressive uh, document with a bridge on it, which is there um, very appropriately a bridge, which is, is an excellent piece of work, which tries to bring together some of the tax, uh, some of the investment treaty issues with uh, tax officials. So tax officials who are involved in negotiations will be aware of, of good practice, and also they'll be aware of some of the issues that they might be, need to be aware of uh, in, their, in their work. So um, now is the, this important uh, moment for, for looking at the interactions and some of the issues which will come up would be, uh, for example, if you have a multilateral treaty, whether it's in the OECD, whether it's somewhere else, and even in our own UN work, um, if you're giving some companies a special treatment, a special dispute settlement regime, uh, such as is, is, uh, would be the case under Pillar 1 for Amount A companies, then does that mean what would happen if non-Amount A companies said, well, we're in a similar position just because we're in a different position in terms of uh, size or profitability, doesn't mean we're different for the purpose of the investment treaty. We want something similar. We want third party uh, dispute settlement. You know, we need to look at, is that an issue and can that be resolved in the multilateral treaty? Another issue that arises is um, you have to guard against uh, 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 broad interpretations of the provisions based on legitimate expectations or legal certainties fair and, and uh, equitable treatment provisions. If you still have them in your treaties, investment treaties, you have to think about how they will apply in, in the context of, uh, of, uh, uh, of any new tax uh, obligations you, you uh, uh, take upon yourself. Um, and, and that's something where, you know, I think there needs to be an analysis, including when you're looking at UN work before you take it on board. How does this fit in? Is there a problem and can the problem be fixed? And another issue is what happens if under pillar two, you have, um, uh, you have to give up an incentive and that incentive is there's a tax stabilization clause in a contract, maybe an umbrella clause picks it up in the investment treaty, maybe fair and equitable treatment even picks it up. Is there an issue that you might then have to pay out the, the investor uh, for the, uh, uh, the loss to them. And whether that's right or wrong, I won't get into. But these are issues which I think should be considered, including by the OECD when it's doing its drafting. So um, those are the main issues. A, a final issue is, is the secrecy of investment and tax disputes the right thing when, when uh, uh, no. we, need to, uh, we need to have more um, uh, uh, confidence that, that m and are paying their correct taxes, is the secrecy uh, appropriate or can you have redacted versions of, uh, of decisions which are taken? So those are the main points uh, uh, that I would say. And very finally, um, we need a, a great awareness of uh, open-ended obligations assumed by governments under, under investment agreements, as UNCTAD has pointed out, and the impact on necessary regulation of business activities, particularly as that, those activities, the basis of them can change over time if we've first seen with business uh, the way it's done. The more modern provisions proposed by UNCTAD and others should become part of country models and should be fought for to ensure modern investment agreements better reflect the balance between a welcoming investment climate and sufficient certainty for investors. On the one hand, 
as well as the need for revenue and the certainty that fairly level tax levied taxes will be paid and will make their proper contribution towards country development. Thank you very much, Richard. Michael, thank you very much for this introduction and, and for uh, spending the time with us. Um, you, you didn't take uh, any credit at all uh, for uh, initiating that wonderful publication, as you said. Um, but let's uh, let's not forget there was a, a paper the, to the UN Tax Committee at the basis of this, which you did. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I think it's been a useful collaboration between our three uh, organizations, basically, to, to get this paper out the door. And uh, thanks for uh, this. It is very useful. It's, you referred already to the reform process of international investment agreements, to which, of course, UNCTAD, on which UNCTAD has done a lot of work over the past decade. We had our um, annual conference on international investment agreements yesterday, which uh, generally usually takes stock of progress on the reform of international investment agreements. And those various um, reforms that uh, UNCTAD over the years has, uh, has proposed, um, as we concluded in our publication, uh, in part take care of uh, quite a number of the sort of, uh, of, the, of the pain points between tax and investment treaties already. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any pain points that remain, as you rightly point out. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, we uh, will move a bit further now and uh, give the floor to our panelists. We have three um, very prominent panelists. We have Anita Kapoor, former chair of the Board of Direct Taxes in India. We have Lisa Lotkana, head of international tax leg legislation at the Ministry of Finance in Chile. And we have uh, Professor Julian Chess of um, School of Law of the City University of Hong Kong. And I will follow the same approach as Jeffrey did. I'll take, uh, I'll take his good example on how to moderate and hopefully I can, I can approach that. Um, so I'll just do it in several rounds. And uh, my first question would go to Anita Kapoor, please. Um, and it's a follow-up to, to uh, what Michael has been talking about. Um, so in, from your perspective and from the Indian perspective, what do tax policymakers really need to know about the operation uh, of international investment agreements? Um, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, this event has been uh, organized in the background of uh, what is happening uh, on the BEPS project, BEPS 2 particularly, and the uh, agreement reached on pillar one and pillar two. Uh, but I think the problem of uh, the tax administrators being aware of what is getting committed in the investment treaties and the investment treaty negotiators being aware of what is happening on the taxation scene uh, is per se there, whether there was BEPS or whether there was BEPS 2 or not. Um, the problem here is uh, not only lack of skills, but also the overlapping uh, area of operations of tax policy makers and investment uh, policy makers. The first thing that a tax policy maker has to be aware of is the existence of the investment treaties and whether taxes are covered in these investment treaties or whether there's a total carve out, partial carve out or total inclusion. In Indian experience, we realized that where we were doing some kind of a partial carve out, the language used did not properly convey the intent because there were other provisions in the treaty, which were interpreted by the tribunals to cover taxation issues. So one has to be very careful where there is a total carve out that the language of the investment treaty captures that intent. You can't put the carve out provision under the FET provision or the MFN provision or the non uh, discrimination provision. You have to put it in the general scope of the treaty itself to say that taxation will not apply. Now let's see, you put it in the expropriation provision. That the, but if you don't clarify that it only covers direct 
expropriation, it does not cover indirect expropriation, then all taxation measures can be treated as becoming expropriation. We've had a number of cases, not particularly attracting Indian uh, cases, but where if you do advanced pricing arrangement and then later the government changes its policy, uh, it becomes expropriation. You do uh, a tax policy initiative, which is treated as abusive or which is treated as discriminatory. And this becomes an issue of expropriation. Then there are cases where the FET, in fact, I consider the FET provision a landmine, landmine for the tax administrators. It is so broadly interpreted by the tribunals that I don't think any treaty negotiator can really understand and comprehend what is going to be the reach of this provision. It can cover stability of the tax regime. It can cover predictability of the tax regime. It will cover the due process in procedure, due process in substance. It will cover all kinds of uh, proportionalities. It will cover what are the expectations of the, uh, of the investor. So all tax provisions can fall within the reach of FET if you have not very carefully either dropped the provision itself, like in the case of India-Brazil treaty, um, the investment treaty, FET has been done away with. In our model treaty also, uh, FET is not there. We are trying to put something in the investment agreement. So the, the pitfalls of having a very loosely worded uh, investment treaty uh, can be a real danger to your genuine efforts to either expand your tax base or make it more fair, uh, more fair with reference to the foreign investment. And um, India has been in news because of the two uh, arbitration awards, uh, both in Ken and in Vodafone. Vodafone detailed award is not available. The summary is available, which says that they invoke the FET clause to strike down a tax measure, a policy measure with the legislator of the legislature of the country took that was struck down on the FET standard. Similarly, in the cane where you have a detailed um, uh, a detailed order available, detailed award available, it's clearly the FET clause which has been invoked and which is the Waterloo for the tax administration. And um, responding to these awards, um, it has been decided to change our law to uh, ensure that the investment treaty obligations as interpreted by the tribunal are honored. So you have to be very careful on FET, the tax administration, very careful on the MFN clause, which can be another problem because in tax treaties, we have stopped giving the MFN clause. It, it really, most of the countries don't uh, offer or agree to a, a MFN clause. Here, people will get advantage for one investment treaty. In fact, you give, concede something in one investment treaty considering your particular relationship, and that becomes applicable across your entire uh, horizon, your entire environment. Um, making a difference between your um, resident taxpayers and your non-resident taxpayers for certain valid reasons can also be attacked um, because there is a, a non-discrimination clause and there are no carve-outs presented in the non-discrimination uh, clause. So um, the scope of the investment treaty itself where um, you define investment in a manner which may in fact violate your limitation of benefit clause, which you have with such strong uh, negotiating skill managed to get incorporated in a particular treaty. That gets totally defeated because most of our investment treaties do not limit the scope for the, our old uh, investment treaties don't limit the scope of investments being covered. So third party investors can take advantage of a bilateral uh, investment treaty. Thank, so, you, Anisha. Thank you very much. I think you, you, you've covered quite a bit of this uh, and I want to hear the, the views of the other panelists on it as well. But before I do, um, I'm just interested also to hear the, the flip side, right? Um, 
uh, just to, to turn it around for a second and to ask uh, Lisa Lott, if I may, um, uh, what is your view um, from from the perspective, well, from your perspective and and from the from the from sit, from being in Chile, what's the um, what is what do the investment policy makers need to know about what is happening on the tax side? So, what do investment policy makers need to know about the operation of tax treaties and the impact of taxation policy in general? So, um, it's the flip side question. Yeah, it's a flip side question, but it's almost the same answer. <laughs> Thank you for your invitation, and I, I think. Um, uh, you know, when I was I was preparing a, for for this panel, I was looking back at uh, an IFA Congress in actually in Mumbai, Anita, in 2014. Uh, it was uh, called Taxation and Non-Taxation Agreements, yeah. and and um, the last slide on that presentation had a question: Are government tax professionals properly connected with government trade officials, or vice versa? And of course, it was no then, and it's no still, no, you know. Yeah. But, but I think, I think the point here is that um, perhaps the most important thing is to try and 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 get investment policymakers to understand tax systems, because they, and 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 I have the same. A curriculum as Michael, I started off with negotiating investment treaties. Uh, so, so you know, I'm I, I, I'm not very proud of it today, but you know, I have like more than thirty of them in my belt, uh, and it makes me a little bit queasy today, to be honest, because um, uh, you know, I think I think Anita is absolutely right. You know, one thing is new issues and 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 beps etc is going to raise these issues but we are actually in a very difficult position now before the beps because we have this uh, cat uh, you know that might pop out of this uh, bottle uh, at, at any moment and i think you know anita has mentioned some of the cases and 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 and, and, and you know the the you know, when GATS was signed, uh, there was not proper understanding, and I don't understand. You know, the, you know, you, you, if you, you remember, you probably remember all of it. That these this strange footnotes to Article 14. You know that the, you know if Ministry of Finance comes in at the end of the negotiation and looks at this, and how, you know the Minister of Finance has a heart attack, uh, and, and, and get these footnotes in, which no one understands except a few uh, people like ourselves. <laughs> and, and, and it's not, you know, it's it, it it's a situation that it's unfortunate. It's never been resolved. You know, people. I think it's such a mess that people are afraid to touch it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, you know. Um, such fundamental principles of of tax of investment and services uh, treaties whatever form they take investment agreements or free modern free trade agreements with chapters on investment non discrimination anita's already mentioned uh, and the you know the fundamental principle on ex expropriation i mean is there anything more clear that it's an indirect expropriation than taxation. So, you know, it, it, it's just mind boggling that that we are, uh, you know, still struggling with these issues even so many years after GATS. So, you know, my, my final point is just that, you know, investment policy makers ne needs to get a fundamental understanding on how tax systems work and why those systems clash with investment treaties and why with free trade agreements. We need to build knowledge uh, for both tax and investment policy makers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. You you echoed a little bit what Logan said in the first uh, part of this uh, of this session, right? He also said that investment policy makers um, uh, often have a very little realization of uh, of, uh, of the of the current changes, even in uh, in in tax uh, in international tax policy. So perhaps uh, you're 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 going in the same direction. Before I turn um, uh, with a different question also to Julian to give him the chance, I just want to quickly turn back to Anita. Uh, if you, um, Anita, if you want to give your perspective as well on this, if you would turn the question around, do you do you agree with Lisa Lot? So, um, uh, the the uh, what do you think investment policymakers need to know about tax treaties? I would take an extreme position, not my government's position, my personal position. We don't need investment treaties. India had 80 plus investment treaties. We terminated, uh, I think, 
um, only seven or eight TTs were left. Uh, the TTs we had negotiated since 90s. But unfortunate part is even the termination allows uh, the protection of the TT for some period to continue even after Anita, the TT. Anita, um, but here we're talking about the investment treaties, but if you're an investment policymaker, you have more to think about than just the investment treaties. So what does the investment policymaker need to understand about the tax treaties? So the investment uh, TT person, uh, or I mean, like, like I said, my extreme position is no investment TT. They want to encourage investment. They have to look at other elements of an economy. They have to provide macroeconomic stability. They have to ensure that we have the right infrastructure. They have to ensure that we are skilling our manpower properly so that people can employ good people, produce goods at lower cost, produce quality goods. We have to give them good financial services. Yeah. We have to give them a comfort level that their investment in the country, in spite of there being no investment treaty, mm -hmm. is secure. We facilitate you, they have to become facilitators of investors rather than becoming just the protectors of investors, which creates more complications, holds out assurances. You do BEPS now, BEPS too, you'll have to withdraw certain incentives. Mm -hmm. And what will happen to the umbrella clauses like uh, 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 Michael referred to? What will happen to the FET standards? What will happen to the MFN clauses? So TTs have created complications while there are other ways of attracting investments and our investment advisors need to focus on those rather than doing TTs, which will complicate Richard, I, I have to come in here because there's a lovely English expression. What you're doing, Anita, is you're chucking the baby out without, with the bath water. Yeah? <laughs> and basically what we need to do is actually see, and there's a broad consensus. We don't like some of the provisions there. But, you know, but the good thing is it seems the investment community is open to discussions. Let's think about how you can redesign them because investment treaties do serve a useful function and they do it in one place. But that, I'm not supposed to be talking in this panel, so excuse me. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, uh, my extreme position and I would like to stick to that position because personally I think you are complicating affairs by doing too many kinds of treaties. Life is complicated, only death is not. It is complicated. Anita, I agree. Let's also hear the perspective of uh, someone who perhaps has, has, takes a different view on this. Um, uh, Julien, can I, can I move to you please? Uh, um, so how, what do you think, how can we achieve greater consistency in the way that taxes are addressed within international investment agreements, tax treaties and tax systems overall? Uh, and particularly perhaps thinking about the area of dispute settlement. Thanks Richard. So it's a great question. And here, I assume that you, you asked me to think um, about solutions by keeping both tax treaties and investment treaties, so I cannot get rough get rid of any of them, right? Um, look, uh, I think, first of all, that question, your question of the greater consistency is, is reasonable and important. I think that is not a side issue. In fact, it is a core issue because both tax and investment regimes are in transition. And this, big question of the, the greater co coherence between the two regimes is going to, to be very important for the coming five or 10 years. I think, and it's a good news, that there are technical and legal solutions. I believe that greater consistency can be addressed um, at two, two main different levels. On the one hand, rulemaking, so substantive rules, and on the other hand, dispute management, so procedure. So briefly, in terms of rule making and substantive rules, I think the main idea is that tax policy makers should be involved in the development of new investment treaties and even uh, model investment treaties that we didn't talk about today, but they play a quite important role for, for many countries. Um, and the same tax policy because should be involved uh, also in the overall reform of all, trend, all generations uh, investment treaties. Uh, we've 
this idea that there is a need to find ways and means to preserve tax policy space under this old or new treaties. I think that, you know, fundamentally, we have to move from the current coexistence, where we have two regimes that coexist, but they ignore each other, to a genuine cooperation with both tax and investment rules being coherent and designed at the same time, or being designed while knowing the implications in the other sphere and for the other region. So in fact, practically, I think that the greater consistency in uh, substantive rules requires at least what I would call a double prong approach. The first objective is to improve treaties under negotiations. So we, we, speak about, we speak here about the future. There are dozens of investment treaties currently under negotiations. And the second objective is to improve the existing stock of investment treaties. We don't have dozens of investment treaties in stock, but uh, thousands. And the, the legal tools to achieve these uh, changes uh, are many. Uh, I'm thinking here about formal treaty amendments, uh, joint interpretation, replacement, termination. So there are, there are many solutions. And legally speaking, there is no major difficulty in this respect. Okay, the, the legal aspect here is not the obstacle. Politics is going to be important. Or more precisely, I think, what's more challenging is for each country to be able to define a stance and a sustainable strategy. And that is something tricky because it requires a robust internal coordination among ministries, agencies in, in charge of trade, investment, and tax to define what should be the country's approach. Uh, quickly, the second level, as I see it, is dispute management. So with respect to dispute management in, in particular, here again, there are solutions. And I would say there are two main, uh, two main options that can foster greater uh, consistency. Firstly, it's possible to implicitly cover tax matters under the substantive provisions but not make them subject to investor state arbitration. That's a solution. You can have uh, taxation covered, I'm not lobbying for that, by favorable treatment, but it can be said in a very explicit manner that uh, no tax related disputes can be brought to investment arbitration. So that's one way to, to look at you know, the way forward. Another element, and I will conclude here, um, one could explore more the, the idea to involve national competent authorities when the disputes arise and emerge. Uh, competent authorities could be involved to make a joint determination as for whether or not a given tax measure or tax related measure can be subject to investment arbitration. And we can imagine a system where uh, the joint interpretation um, would block um, uh, the claim and this would prevent investment tribunals to interfere with tax policies. So this can be organized against, you know, technically speaking, there is no problem. There is a way in short, and I conclude here, to move uh, from investor state dispute settlement also to something that will be more state-to-state -state dispute resolution um, with the hope uh, that that state-to-state -state arbitration could strike a better balance between the different uh, stakes involved in these massive disputes. Thank you very much, Ilya, for those, uh, those, those, those two ideas. Um, very interesting. Um, Lisa Lott, can I ask you the same question and perhaps also to, to your view on, on those, those ideas? But the, the question being, uh, what, what are your ideas for greater consistency in the way taxes are addressed within both sets of treaties? Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree. You know, we need to have a greater consistency. And, and usually how we do that is, you know, together in a multilateral type of framework. 
um, to draft rules that can be accepted by many people, uh, many partners. Uh, however, we, you know, we, we have experiences where it's worked, like, you know, like the tax OECD, UN tax treaty models, but we also have, you know, the experience of the OECD uh, model agreement on investment, which is, a, you know, spent a lot of time and then in the end of the day it was shelved. Jeffrey will remember very well. I survived uh, it, just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that, 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 you know, it, it was done at the same time as NAFTA and, and, and EU. And I think uh, when, when the NAFTA countries wheeled in their exceptions, uh, I think it was uh, putting the nail in the, in the coffin. And it just shows it's just extremely difficult rules. Uh, and it's, um, um, you know, I, I, you know, it really, really needs a very high level of political understanding. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, how do you get to, to the high level and get a political consensus at high level? Um, I, I think it's, it's not easy, but, you know, I think the responsibilities of people like this group is to reach these people and, and make, you know, make options available, like Juliana has just mentioned to us, different options that, you know, this is what's going to happen, you know, this is, this is on the table now. It will be worse when you get BEPS too, uh, and, and, and this is, has to be solved somehow. And I think, I think, um, uh, you know, to, to get to, to high policy, people will be 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 the really the clue. But you know, also Julian, I mean, I I negotiate these things, and and it's it you know it's it sounds easy to say that let's take out all the tax issues uh, from from a, a treaty, and 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 I, I tell you, it's not that easy. <laughs> and, and the problem is there already. You know that's 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 the issue. And for me, for me, that's that that it, this is ongoing. You 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 Julian was just saying there's trade. You know we are involved in many uh, treaties actually being and you mix you know the modern free trade agreements now have investment and services exactly. so so you know it's it's not only the investment policy people that can put you know have an input there there's a range of different areas in ministry of economy finance foreign affairs development everyone gets their word in and and you know it it it, it gets really difficult to have your voice heard in that and and for people to really understand the the the, the difficult thank you Lisa. i see michael uh, is still with us and has raised his hand michael would you like to react Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'll be very brief because I had my piece, but I think the sustainable development goals show a bit of the light ahead because they recognise that sustainable development includes encouraging investment, but also domestic resource mobilisation and revenue. And, and each of that will affect different parts of your, your society. So I, I think there has to be some level of certainty to both participants in that process. And and the treaty should express that. I think part of the problem is that that sometimes the the investment people seek absolute certainty, and panelists will go to all sorts of efforts to contortions to interpret fair and equitable treatment to give a pro investor decision. And and to be honest, uh, tax people are sometimes the opposite. You know, I've heard tax people say expropriation shouldn't be covered in, in investment agreements, but why shouldn't it if it's if it's actually an expropriation? Why should it be protected because it's referred to uh, as a tax? So I think, first of all, you need to recognise that. that, that uh, that's why I don't like talking about tax certainty, because I think absolute tax certainty for, for one stakeholder can reduce certainty for another stakeholder, and that may not be the balance we want. I think you need more forums like, like this, and, and it's great to see Julianne here. I've read a lot of his work. It, it's, it's really important to have forum where people from these different spheres can come together and, and, and learn the language of each other, because the language is different. The language of most favoured nation is, is even different in some respects. So I think that's what I would say. We need more fora where, where the the, the different parties can come together at technical level, but also at high level. The problem at high level is often is such an abstract result that it doesn't achieve anything. You need also the, the lower level people. And I think getting a common language is, is always helpful. So they would be 
be my suggestions. And hopefully the UN and hopefully UNCTAD and hopefully, uh, you know, academics such as uh, uh, Jeffrey and his colleagues can, can all come together in a forum where, where that can make the contribution towards the recognition. No one's going to get complete certainty, but you need an element of certainty. And the framework for that certainty is what is the treaty you've signed? Get good treaty language, sign good treaties, and then adhere to that treaty. And if it needs to be improved over time as business has changed, then do that. Sorry for that. I've spoken at length, but I, I think the SDGs are the, mm -hmm. the, the, the way forward. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And we're just happy uh, to still have you in our session. Very good. Um, so we have a few minutes left. So I'm going to uh, give the chance to each of our three uh, panelists just in one minute, please, if you can, if you can. Um, a final question. Your thoughts, please, on how the international community can take forward this debate. Just uh, how, what's, what's, the, what's the future? Just your thoughts. Can I start with Anita, uh, please, if you can, in one minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Michael and I see the problems uh, of the investment treaties and the uh, tax treaties getting further complicated uh, because of the BEPS too. So the best policy is to come on a common platform, uh, try and work out a model, uh, though earlier uh, effort was about it. But there, if you could develop a consensus on uh, tax treaty, you which in age uh, have a much longer history than the investment treaties have. Uh, so thereby the interpretational issues can also be limited. So the effort should be to get a common language, to get a common understanding, make a simple uh, investment facilitation treaty, limit it to the state to state disputes rather than investor to state disputes, which adds its own complexity and keep it as simple, as comprehensible that a class 12 student can understand what the implications are. Thank you. I mean, so politicians. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. Um, Lisa Lott, I'll pass on to you in one minute, your view. Yeah, a very quick comment. I, th I think one of the issues that, that is um, very real, and I, I think that's why the UN has a very important role to play here, is that investment agreements are usually signed between developed and developing countries. Tax treaties are much more general, and and you know a large portion, you know, developed developed countries signs them, but but there are very few uh, investment agreements signed between developed countries. And I think NAFTA and the free trade agreements from that area, the Chapter Eleven and 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 and, and you know the TPP that we have that Chile forms part of today, um, it, it's a branch of it. But but I think. And and then you have this absolute complex, you know, uh, exceptions for taxation, which perhaps works. Um, but but you know, I think the problem, and and I think this session is more focused on investment agreements. I think the particularity with investment agreements is that it's, it's very unbalanced the, the the negotiation. And I think you know, if I could you know ask for for it, I think if we can take advantage of what BEPS2 is going to happen in an inclusive framework uh, framework <laughs> um, to try and solve the problems that's going to be in dispute, uh, in, not only in BEPS2, but, but you know, if, if there is, could be something that countries can look at and, and try to resolve uh, the problems they are all, they are going to face at one point with the old investment agreements that we have. Thanks so that's much, a challenge Lisa. for 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 all of us. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very much. Final word for Julian, please. Uh, look, just two things. First, I, uh, we began the discussion. We have to carry on, um, but this this question of uh, coherence is going to, to stay around for for many years. Um, in particular, because if nothing changes, uh, I'm pretty sure that new investment disputes will begin. And, and, and there may be connections, even more connection to, to tax and, and BEPS. For the near future, it's not too bad, but I would suggest to pay great attention to the pillar two and how its implementation will interact with investment treaties. Second point uh, to conclude on a positive note, 
I think we also have to, to remember that trade and investment were two very different communities in the mid 80s, early 90s. And over the last 20 years, trade and investment lawyers have been able to uh, converge. And that's why we have now so many FTAs and big FTAs, the CPTPP, RCEP, EU, Vietnam, that combine both trade and investment regulation. So I don't think it's impossible to, to foster a greater convergence between the investment and tax community at forums like UN, OECD, and also involving academics. Right, thank you, Julian. I think that's a great note to end on, right? A bit of hope for the future of that convergence between the different communities. We're going to wrap up. Um, I'm going to give um, the floor to Jeffrey um, um, before, we, before we close our session. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Richard. This has been a really rich discussion over the last two hours. I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to summarize them. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, I see this as the start of a debate in both of the issues that we've looked at, session one and session two here. Yeah? Um, and it seems to me on, on the session one, what came out of the, you know, the broad agreement that we move into a phase of fundamental reform of the international tax rules. Um, and the, um, this is not just an issue of, of the pillar two, which we focus on minimum taxes, but rather it's looking at the whole of the BEPS, pillar one and pillar two, and asking ourselves, what impact is this going to have on investment flows? Um, what impact is it going to have on the global investment climate? Yeah? And, and I think already we've seen the answer is a big impact. And to me, that suggests that we need to continue this engagement between the investment community and, and, and the tax community as well, yeah? And particularly important over the next two years, because as David said, that's when the details are gonna be worked out. That's when you know, the, the fans, well, I was gonna use an expression, but that's when in fact, you know, the, the real nuts and bolts of these agreements will be worked out, yeah? So very important to keep that, uh, that engagement on the part of the investment community. I think the bigger picture that's emerging from our discussions, it's a whole debate on what is acceptable and unacceptable in terms of competition, tax competition or, ta or competition more generally. Yeah? Um, and we've seen, in fact, you know, the OECD has staked out its rules, whether it's on VEPS Action 5, whether it's now on the minimum tax. The Euro European Union has come in, not just on the tax side, but on the state of state aids. Um, the um, many, and, and this is a point mentioned by Julian, many of the, um, the investment agreements, uh, the trade agreements actually are now touching on on investment as well, yeah? And also I think we, we will see an increasing involvement and engagement by the World Trade Organization in the area of tax subsidies. Uh, so I think this whole big question of what's acceptable and what's unacceptable in terms of competition is going to be a really uh, important issue. And when we look at that, um, even though this discussion has tended to focus very much on you know, tax treaties and bilateral investment treaties, I think we have to recognize, and that's a point that Lieselot made, that increasingly the trade agreements, look at the RCEP in Asia, yeah, or the recent African signed agreement, they're, they're covering investment. They're covering a lot of provisions of investment, and there's very little discussion on what are the tax issues that are raised by these agreements, yes? which is why I think, Michael, that the committee, the UN committee, it can't limit itself to bilateral investment treaties, it has to also look at the trade area as well, as well, yeah. Um, so that, that's important, yeah. Um, there are a number of technical issues that Michael raised, in fact, on, on the way that these the uh, IEAs operate, whether it's in questions of the fair and equitable treatment, probably one of the most difficult areas. Uh, I've ne never been very happy with that. What constitutes non-discrimination? How do you apply most favored nation clauses? Stabilization clauses, which are going to take on a new importance because of what's happening in Bepster, in, in, in the globe and the minimum tax proposals. Yes. Um, but here, in a sense, I think it's a point that Lieslot made as well. Uh, we, you know, if we are going to resolve these issues, we need a common understanding. We need a common language. Yes? That's what we need. And I know I'm almost finished. Yes? And, and then the last thing is, I think, the, the whole question of dispute resolutions. I think the time is now ripe for us all to come together and say, how do we get a common understanding of how mediation and arbitration would work? How do we address the concerns of developing countries? Yes? And that, in a sense, I think is where, you know, uh, UNCTAD is very well placed to that. Yeah. So start of a discussion, not the end of a discussion. I'll stop. Great. Wonderful, Jeffrey. And uh, I agree with you. It's been a fantastic discussion. And uh, we have some work to do. Let me just use one minute to wrap up. Um, we had UNCTAD 15 just two weeks ago. That is the intergovernmental meeting that gives the name to our organization and sets our mandate. And it resulted in a Bridgetown Covenant, which is the end uh, negotiated result of it, which asks UNCTAD to 
work on taxation, specifically as it relates to investment policy. So we, we have our work cut out for us. Um, and to start with, just this session is a very good starting point, I think. We'll start with summarizing the proceedings of this, uh, of this event, uh, lift out some of the key insights that Jeffrey already started to talk about. Um, we will also work with, um, with uh, um, our colleagues um, at, um, at Vi in Vienna to work on a reverse guide, basically the, the, the reverse question I asked earlier, what do investment policymakers need to know about everything that's going on in tax? And we have close, we're close to publishing uh, an international investment agreements briefing, that's our, our uh, common presentation on the 140 ISDS cases that are somehow dealing with tax. Um, and of course, we continue to work with our colleagues at the UN Tax Committee. Um, I'm there on Monday, and we will continue working together on this. So with that, uh, just looking at the future of UNTAD's work on this, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much to all the speakers and panelists. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey and Joy, for working with us on this. Bruno uh, Gazella in, in UNCTAD, who's done an enormous amount of work putting this together with the help of Jean-Philippe and Ailey. So thank you very much, everyone, for, um, for good work on this session. I hereby close our meeting.